What's up, my friends? Welcome to the Warrior Poet Project podcast. We've battled with technology and it looks like we're coming out ahead. This is our second try real quick with Stephen Kotler, author of The Rise of Superman. And we're going to get deep into flow state, how it can benefit your life, how you can use it to optimize yourself and how he used it to get himself out of a pretty dire situation. So, Stephen, welcome to the show once again, my friend. Thanks for having me. For sure. So as you were starting to tell, um, you found yourself in a pretty shitty spot. And uh, so, so take us to that spot, and uh, we'll start from there. Okay. So I uh, was 30 years old, got Lyme disease, and uh, spent the better portion of three years in bed. Really, really you know, sick, totally reduced, basically functional 10% of the time. Meaning like I had about an hour a day where I could walk around and I could think clear headedly. And, you know, other than that, I was just, you know, I was a wreck. And after, I don't know, two and a half years, the doctors pulled me off medicine. Uh, There wasn't anything else they could do for me. And my stomach lining was bleeding out. I was having a bad reaction to it and I wasn't getting any better. And I, you know, made a practical decision to to kind of end my life because, you know, the only thing I was going to be at that point was a burden to my friends and my family. And in the middle of all this darkness, a friend of mine showed up my doorstep and demanded that we go surfing. And, you know, it was a ridiculous request. I could barely walk across a room, but she was insistent and she was insistent and she was insistent. And after hours of listening to her badger me, I was like, you know what? What the hell? I can kill myself tomorrow. Let's just go surfing today. Anything to just get her to shut up. And they sort of loaded me into the car and uh, drove me out to Sunset Beach in Los Angeles, which is a really, really friendly beginner wave. And the tide was really low. And, you know, they gave me a board the size of a Cadillac. And the bigger the board, the easier it is to surf. And I, you know, I was so sick, they had to kind of take me by the elbows and really kind of almost carry me out to the break. And I, you know, sat down on my board and I was out there, I don't know, 30 seconds a minute and a wave came and muscle memory took over and I spun the board around and I paddled and I popped my feet. And I popped up into a totally different dimension, a dimension I had no idea even existed. And, you know, my senses were incredibly heightened and felt like I had panoramic vision, like I could see out of the back of my head and time and slow to like an absolute crawl, like that freeze frame effect in the matrix. Or if you've been in a car crash, you know what I'm talking about. And the strangest part was I felt amazing. I mean, I felt great. I felt, you know, more alive than I had felt in, in years. And it felt so good, so amazing. I, I ended up catching four more waves that day. And you know, by the time uh, I caught that fifth wave, I was just disassembled. I was done. They loaded me back into the car and drove me home, and I couldn't move, couldn't get out of bed for a couple of weeks. People had to bring me food. I couldn't make it to my kitchen, which was, you know, 100 feet away, 50 feet away, whatever. And uh, on the 15th day, which is the day I could kind of walk again, I caught a ride back to the beach, and I did it again. And over the course of six to eight months, when the only thing I was doing differently in my life was surfing, I went from 10% functionality up to 80% functionality, which, you know, raises the giant question of what the hell is going on, right? Surfing is not a known cure for chronic autoimmune conditions. And worse, it limes only fatal if it gets into your brain. And I'm a science guy. I'm a rational materialist. I don't have quasi-mystical experiences, and I certainly don't have them while surfing. That was just impossibly flaky for me. And I was pretty sure the only reason I was having these experiences was because the disease had gotten into my brain and was actually, even though I was feeling better, it was killing me. So I you know, lit out on a giant quest to figure out what the hell was going on with me. And that's kind of where all of this started. So when you say, you know, you- you popped up into another dimension. I think, you know, for the listeners to this show, um, that could mean a variety of different things. But for you, it was just such a contrast to the state at which you'd been living, this state of just (coughs) intense brain fog, depression, all of these kind of depressive, inflammatory effects of, of your condition. All of that lifted and a new reality was kind of there. Is that kind of, you know, accurately describing what you're talking about? It is. I mean, the state, right? Well, I, you know, in on my quest to figure out what was going on with me, I quickly discovered that these strange state of consciousnesses had a name, right? We call them flow states, mm-hmm. though there are lots of synonyms: runner's high, being in the zone. If you're a basketball player, you call it being unconscious. If you're a stand-up comic, it's the forever box, right? The lingo goes on and on. Flow is a technical term, and it refers to an optimal state of consciousness, right? It's the state of consciousness where we feel our best. And we perform our best. And so, you know, it is literally, you know, for a lot of neurobiological reasons that we now understand, it's literally the best high on earth, right? That's the best we can possibly feel on this planet. So, yeah, was it was it radically different from what <laughs> I've been feeling for three years? Uh-huh. It certainly yeah. was. 
So it's pretty much the best feeling ever for anybody, but for someone in your dire condition, it was so radically different than your current state of being that it was it was a religious experience. It was a revelation. Oh yeah, it was beyond. I mean, it it, it was beyond that. I you know, so I I strange story, but this is kind of you want to I'll, I'll quantify it for you. Um, years ago, I got to interview uh, as, as a journalist. I got to know Rick Doblin, who runs Maps, which yeah, is the, I know him as well. He's been on the okay, podcast. Okay, so. Rick was telling me about like, you know, the when he when he had his bar mitzvah, he was really pissed afterwards because he, you know, he he had expected this that you know this he was going to get this giant download from God and he was going to come out the other <laughs> end and totally transformed and nothing happened and he was mad. And then years later, as he's a freshman in college, he did acid for the first time and his response was like, "Holy shit, this is what my bar mitzvah should have been like," <laughs> right? Yeah, Which I love. Sure. I think that's an amazing story. But that, I mean, like. That's the con. That's what it felt like to me. It's. I mean, I and you know, it. I had never really. I really went in my early twenties. I dropped out of college for a while, and I. I went looking for mystical experiences. I did lots of psychedelics, and I lived in ashrams and monasteries, and I really tried hard, and not once, not once, did anything mystical or mysterious or, or anything like that ever happen. Right. That's sort of how I ended up going in the other direction. I spent years hunting, seeking. I could sit in the full lotus for eight hours at a time, but nothing magical, mystical ever happened. Wow. And then, you know, I become a hardcore science writer and, you know, rational materialist and years and years and years and years go by and suddenly I go surfing and I'm having like the mystical experiences I always wanted to have. It was bizarre. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's funny how everybody has their specific triggers that for them um, can create these these heightened states. Um, but for you, certainly the backdrop was set by your, by your existing condition, no doubt. So tell us a little bit about then what is, what exactly is going on? Because there's a release of a whole host of chemicals and there's a variety of different functions <coughs> that are going on yep. in the brain. Um, so explain that from a scientific perspective. So let's, let's just start with where I started with, with the story, just to clear this up. We won't spend much time on it, but why did, you know, why, why, why did these flow states help my condition uh, is the first question. And there are five really potent neurochemicals that underpin the state. And among the many other things they do, they boost the immune system and they reset the nervous system. They literally like once they, they flush, fl flush all the stress hormones out of your body so they calm it down. An autoimmune condition is a nervous system gone haywire. So by calming down, by resetting it to zero and then boosting my immune system, I was really literally using flow to kind of create the space to heal. That's kind of what was going on. Um, and this is kind of all fairly well established at this point in terms of flow's impact on kind of the immune, immune function and, and whatnot. But if you want to, to drill down into your question, right, if you want to talk about what's causing flow, right, in the brain, you want to talk about three things. Neuroanatomy, right, where in the brain is something taking place. Neurochemistry and neuroelectricity, which are the two ways the brain communicates. So the first change is, is neuroanatomical. And the old idea here is what's called the 10% brain myth. The old idea was that we're only using 10% of our brain, but ultimate performance, aka flow, has to be the full brain on overdrive, right? turns out we had it exactly backwards. In flow, it's not that parts of the brain are becoming hyperactive. They're actually deactivating. They're starting to shut down. The technical term is transient hypofrontality. Transient meaning temporary. Hypo, H-Y-P-O. It's the opposite of hyper. It means to slow down, to deactivate. And frontality is the prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that houses your executive function, all your higher cognitive functions. And this explains a lot of like the strange phenomenological qualities of flow. For example, why does time pass so strangely in flow? The technical term is time dilation. It means it either slows down and you get that freeze frame effect I had while surfing or it speeds up and five hours will pass by in like five minutes. It's because time is calculated all over the prefrontal cortex. So when parts of it start to shut down, right, when the prefrontal cortex becomes hypofrontal, it can no longer perform the calculation and we can no longer separate past from present from future and we're plunged into what researchers call the deep now, which is a very like fully present state, right? Mm -hmm. So that's neuroanatomical. I talked about neurochemistry, right? These five extremely potent neurochemicals and they're the 
five most potent pleasure drugs the brain can produce. And flow seems to be the only time the brain produces all of them at once. So when you say it's the kind of the most potent drug on earth or the most addictive state on earth, you're not, you're not actually exaggerating. Um, the, the neurobiology underneath it kind of bears this out, which is also why, you know, researchers refer to flow as the source code of intrinsic motivation. Because once an experience starts producing flow, like my surfing experience, right, it didn't matter how sick I was, you will go extraordinarily far out of your way to get more flow. And the last bit is brain waves, right? The neuroelectricity and normal waking consciousness is, is a beta wave, right? It's a fast moving way. That's kind of where we are when we're just kind of up thinking, having this conversation. Flow is a much slower wave. It actually takes place at the borderline between alpha, which is sort of the daydreaming state where you're not really attaching to thoughts and you're going from idea to idea without a lot of internal resistance and theta. Theta only shows up when we're dreaming or right as we're falling asleep in that hypnagogic state. So flow actually exists on kind of the borderline between alpha and theta. And if you want to kind of talk about what is flow, right, I always start with these kind of these neurochemicals, this change to brain waves and this, uh, this alteration in uh, processing, right, and the prefrontal cortex shuts down. That's kind of like, that's the current scientific definition of what is a flow state. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, because we, you know, we talk about all three of those in, in different perspectives, and it seems like they all tend to coincide. Do you have a, is there a, an instinct or an understanding as to which one of those is first? Like what gets triggered first? Is it the uh, chemical? It's a great, it's a great question. So first of all, let's back out for half a second, because you're, you're, the last point you made is totally right. We now know that it's not just flow, it's any altered state of consciousness, right? Right. That's what we're talking about here. Flow is just one variety, but all these changes. And there are subtle differences, right? Meditation and flow both produce transient hypofrontality. But in meditation, there's a portion of your brain called the uh, orbital medial prefrontal cortex that governs creative self-expression, right? Creative decision-making. In meditation, it's shut down. It, it totally turned off because you don't need it, right? You're trying to block out self. In flow, which is this massively heightened state of near-perfect decision-making where all you're doing is making great creative decisions after great creative decisions and so much so one is leading to the next, leading to the next, the experience feels flowy, which is where its name comes from. Um, that portion of the brain is actually hyperactive. So there are changes, really you know, specific, specific changes between one and the other. But as to your question, it's a giant puzzle. No one is exactly certain. What, uh, what comes first, what changes first. And to make matters even more complex, it may vary experience to experience to experience. Right. Right. Like when action adventure sport athletes get kicked into flow, oftentimes they're riding a massive dopamine high, right? And dopamine is kind of a, one of the brand's principal reward drugs, but it's also a very powerful focusing mechanism. And it shows up whenever we take a risk. So these guys jump off something dopamine floods into their system automatically because it shows up when we take a risk. Um, and if the risk is taken in very uncertain conditions like skiing or snowboarding, you know, backcountry kind of conditions, it's even more dopamine. They ride that into the zone. But there's lots of other different kind of entrance points into flow. People, you know, creativity drives you into flow. And then nobody, you know, so the triggers may differ from situation yeah. to situation and they may differ genetically. You may be more susceptible to certain triggers and certain entrance ways than other people. So there's really, there's no good answer to that. But I will say my organization, the Flow Genome Project, what we are working on right now, one of our big research projects, our main one is a biophysical based flow detector. And as of right now, the way it's looking, it's not totally built yet. We, we haven't dialed it in. We can't, you can't measure neurochemistry in the brain as a general rule, but you can, certain neurochemicals you can look at um, outside of the brain, norepinephrine. For example, pupil dilation correlates with norepinephrine. So we're going to use that coupled with really good uh, EEG brainwave stuff um, that can also possibly look at a little bit of the transient hypofrontality stuff. So we're starting to poke at ways to get at this. Yeah. And we're looking at other kind of biophysical correlates um, that may stack up as well. Yeah, it's really interesting to, you know, because all of these different entry points, you know, because I know some of the latest research in psilocybin that they're doing, like through the Hefter Institute there and the Beckley Institute, they're finding that what psilocybin is actually doing, instead of adding something to the brain, which you would think, oh, I'm taking psychedelics, it's adding some 
spiritual gateway or something like that. It's really a restrictive device. It's restricting yep. blood flow through the default mode network or some. Huxley, other- Huxley had it backwards, right? We're not flinging open the doors of perception. We're shutting them down. Um, he literally had it completely backwards. And the, you know, the, inter- and, but it's, it's, you know, the funny thing about psilocybin is, I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, people hallucinate in, I think it's one of eight patterns. There are eight primary hallucinations. So it's not like you take psilocybin and you see whatever. You see very specific things. And once you realize that, you start to realize, you can see the subtraction. So first level of visual processing, as you probably know, is really basic pattern recognition. It's just looking kind of for outlines and borders and edges. But if that level of pattern recognition gets fuzzy, as happens uh, with psilocybin, You can no longer separate things. So what happens when you look at things, the borders start to swirl and they start to twirl. And that's where that kind of melting of things into one another comes from. It's literally, you know, a pattern interruption at the basic level of visual processing. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's happening to your visual field. But what's happening to the other parts of your brain are, I'm sure, you know, I don't know the brainwave studies on psilocybin or anything like that, but you're starting to get insight and information and problem solving capabilities like you would have in flow state. It's opening up these different channels. And I think actually, if you know, if you look a little deeper into some of Huxley's writings, which I have, um, you know, he talks about opening the doors of perception by reducing the brain's ability to be a filter. So in, in some ways he is talking about actually doing the same thing. He's calls the brain a cognitive filtering device. And yeah, and he's not wrong. He's not wrong. And you're actually I mean, you're literally so dopamine, which we've been talking about and norepinephrine, which we've been talking about, they do. They, they're primarily focusing drugs, right? And they speed up reaction times and heart rate and things along those lines. But they also uh, change signal to noise thresholds. Mm-hmm. So they amplify pattern recognition, right? Which is exactly what Huxley's talking about. Pattern recognition is our ability to link ideas together, right? Mm-hmm. So in whether it's flow or psilocybin, it's really pronounced in flow state. And we've got pretty good measures on kind of the amplification flow makes on creativity. And depending on whose studies you look at, the amplification is 400 to 700%. It's a massive, massive increase in creativity. And a lot of it comes from, you know, the heightened attention, right? You're taking in more information per second and the heightened pattern recognition. You're making more connections between those ideas. And, you know, the result is a massive boost in creativity, um, which, you know, is, I think, what Huxley was getting at, you know, among other things with the flinging open of the doors of perception. For sure. So we're starting to talk about these different ways to kind of hack flow, if you, you know, if you want, if you will. So there's, you know, ways like, obviously, psilocybin is a way, meditation, uh, flotation tanks, sensory deprivation tanks, they work similarly to you know, meditation and getting you to that state. There's ways also, as we've talked about with you, surfing, you know, action sports, ways to trigger that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that method. Um, And then it seems that there's other ways that you can manipulate it through, you know, neurofeedback or just thinking patterns that can get your brain waves to trigger into more alpha, uh, into more alpha thinking, which may, that, that entry point might actually be altering your brain waves getting you to flow state. So it's like there's different channels. Either you can do it through the neurochemical, um, you can do it through actually altering your thoughts, which alter your brain waves, or you can do it more physically um, through shutting off some of the blood supply, each having slightly different effects, but all yielding a similar result in dramatically increased performance. The way we look at it is, and we now know that, that flow itself, there are 17 flow triggers. These are preconditions that bring on more flow. And all of them share one thing in common. Flow is a present tense experience. It, it's all about what happens when we you know, put so much attention on the task at hand that everything else kind of disappears, right? So all of these triggers are quite simply ways of driving attention into the now and very, very kind of fast and quick ways. Meditation, Mm -hmm. it can take decades to get good enough to put yourself actually into a deep flow state, but you can use other triggers, other ways to get in and you can get in really, really, really quickly. So what are some of those, what are some of those ways that, you know, I mean, obviously we don't always have a a helicopter and a parachute we can jump out of or a big wave or so. So So let's, let's, let's start where you're starting with the action sport athletes. So 
There are three external triggers, things found in the environment, three internal. There's one creative, and then there are 10 social triggers. And the social triggers are for producing group flow, which is kind of the shared collective version of, of a flow state. What happens when a band comes together or a fourth quarter comeback in football or what happened with the Seahawks last weekend, if you saw the game, Hell yeah. um, right? That's, that, that's group flow in action. So there's 10 triggers that bring that on. But let's, you, you were talking about action adventure sport athletes. And, and this is, uh, again, a lot of the work we've done at the Flow Genome Project because at, these athletes are probably the best flow hackers on earth. They're, they can reliably re- bring about bring on this experience almost at will and they're really really good at it and we you know we started asking the question of why what's what's going on here and one of the reasons the main reason is these three environmental triggers and anybody can use these right they're not just for action sport athletes and well the first one is risk which is obvious right flow follows focus and consequences catch our attention these guys and gals perform in very 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 high risk environments and it drives a lot of attention into the now. But here's the really cool thing. They're using physical risk, but you don't have to, right? You're, you can replace the physical risk with emotional risk, creative risk, social risk. Social risk is fantastic. The brain literally processes social risk and social fear in the exact same structures. It processes physical risk and physical fear. So the brain can't tell the difference. And as a result, you get the same kind of big dopamine push from both. And it sounds ridiculous. Like, why would social fears equal physical fears? But go back 300 years, and if you screwed up socially, if you got banished, if you got exiled, if you got kicked out of the tribe, it was a capital punishment, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody could live on their own. So we process social fear and social risk at the same place we process the physical stuff it's also it's also entirely relative big wave surfer may have to paddle into a 25 foot wave to pull this trigger but the shy guy only has to like speak up at the meeting to pull this trigger or walk across the bar and say hello to the pretty girl right it's totally individual based on where you are and you don't have to you know risk your actual hide for it you can you can take emotional risk or creative risk and social risk those kinds of things so that's the first one that in the environmental list, the action adventure sport athletes rely so heavily on. I want to cover one thing that that you know I just it just occurred to me, and it actually occurred to me when you were speaking as well. You know, some of these triggers <clears throat> it creates a very addictive um, it creates a very addictive reward system. And I was thinking about these social um, you know these social risk emotional risk triggers, and I'm wondering if people's enthusiasm towards having these one night stands and these flings and these, um, you know, finding a new lover. When you're doing that, you're placing yourself at pretty high levels of social, emotional risk. And because generally the experience, if you ask somebody, why'd you do it? How was it? It was, it's not so much that the experience was that great, but there's some kind of quality that brings people back to doing it. And it may not just be the chemistry with that person at all. It may be that you're triggering enough social emotional risk in this new situation that you're slightly addicted to the flow state that it creates that. that well, let's, I mean, moment. slightly addicted is the, is an understatement. And we, t- <laughs> I, you know, we're very, very, very upfront when we talk about flow, this is dangerous. You're playing with fundamentally addictive neurochemistry chemicals and really, really basic, basic human motivations, right? Evolutionary hardwired motivations. These are very powerful things. Creatives across the boards. If you, it doesn't really matter what you're doing creatively, you need flow to do it. It's fundamental. One of the reasons creatives have such an enormously high suicide rate is because they're getting into flow and it's this enormous high and it's followed by this very, very deep low. The backs the flow is a cycle and on the backside of a flow state, you burn through all these neurochemicals, right? It takes a little while for the body to make more. It takes certain vitamins and minerals and sunshine, et cetera, et cetera. And so huge high of feeling like Superman into this very deep, dark low. And it's, you know, what we talk about to get people through that low because it's you have, to get back into flow, you have to restart the whole cycle. So you want to move through smoothly and cleanly. Th- the protocols are addiction management protocols. Hmm. Um, this is flow is considered the most addictive state on earth. Now, so my our, our point, what we always tell people is, look, this is if you're interested in flow hacking and, and this kind of work, this is not self help, right? It's not self help for two reasons. On the upside, self help is five percent better, ten percent better. 
McKinsey did a 10-year study of top executives in flow. They found top executives are five times more productive in flow. That's 500% more productive. Learning, according to studies done by the U.S. military, jumps up 200 to 500% in flow. Creativity, 400 to 700%. These are massive amplifications, right? But you don't like what goes up must come down. So on the other side of it, there is a dark side to flow. This is dangerous. When we, you know, we run all kinds of courses at uh, at the Flow Genome Project, including a Flow Fundamentals course that's open to the public that anybody can take online. But we, you know, when you want to take that course, the first thing we tell people is, look, this is great. But if you have a m really deep emotional issues that you haven't worked through yet, we're going to mess you up. Don't don't do this. Solve your stuff first, then come do this. This is this is not to be taken lightly. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in esoteric terms, right? It's a left-handed path. It's, you know, questions everywhere and no real right answers and very, very dangerous. Well, we like to live dangerously on this podcast. So let's continue with the triggers, Stephen Kotler. Let's figure Absolutely. out. Absolutely. Okay, this so let's shit. cover the next couple environmental <laughs> triggers. The next one is, and we've been alluding to this all day, is a rich environment right? Lots of novelty, lots of complexity, lots of unpredictability. All of these things are massive, massive dop dopamine triggers, right? The, as a matter of fact, uncertainty triggers the highest, the most powerful dopamine release you can get from the brain, right? The brain loves maybe more than anything else. Um, so anytime these athletes go into the backcountry, Lots of novelty, lots of unpredictability, lots of complexity, right? No two waves are the same. The snowpack in the mountains morphs on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, right? But you don't obviously need to be an action-adventure sport athlete to have these experiences. In fact, most people have had a taste of this if you've ever felt awe, right? You look up at the night sky, you see billions of galaxies and you're overwhelmed by the, the vastness of it or you look at the Grand Canyon and you're overwhelmed by kind of geological time mm -hmm. you can't quite process it and so you get kicked into awe which is what happens like reality seems to pause for a moment and you're taking in more information per second and it's this deep rich experience it's the front edge of a flow state so anybody can access more of this by increasing the amount of knowledge complexity and unpredictability in their lives mm -hmm. and you know simple stuff works incredibly incredibly well I for example when I'm developing flow protocols for people one of the things I always tell people to do is every day read 25 pages of a book that is outside your main area of interest just something mm -hmm. that you know something new so because you you're getting you need the new ideas you need to you need to feed that kind of all the time and it really ups the amount of flow in your life. So, you know, if you can put yourself in those environments, if you can take more vacations, you know, all that kind of stuff, do different things, drive to work differently, all that stuff is tr producing the neurochemicals you need and sort of training the brain to get into flow more easily. That probably contributes also to, you know, why when people go out of the country, even when you're on some of these trips, you know, it's like sometimes the trips are annoying, but you look back at the trip and you're like, man, that trip I took overseas, that was the best trip ever. You know, because even, you know, a lot of these experiences, it sounds like, get triggered. If you're in a place that doesn't speak the language, you've never seen it before, you're figuring stuff out, the signs don't make any sense, half the people speak English. You know, I mean, that is, seems like the one of the most rich environments for triggering flow, uh, according to some of the stuff you talked about that I can imagine. Yeah, I mean, for sure, for sure. I mean, there are reasons people are travel junkies, mm -hmm. you know, and for sure. And it's interesting, you know, you're, I mean, so... We talked about flow amplifying learning, and you actually just gave a really cool example of it. The, why this happens is the more neurochemicals that show up during an experience, the better chance that experience moves from short-term holding into long-term storage, right? Neurochemicals, among their many functions, one of the things they do is they tag experiences, and they're these big neon signs that say important, save for later, right? Flow is this giant neurochemical dump, so it's a lot of these signs at once. What's interesting about it is when you think back on your trip, you're right. Foreign travel, 97% of it, right? And I've done a ton of it, especially, you know, the 25 years I spent as a journalist. I think I've been around the world four or five times by now. Um, it's 90% of it is boredom. And, you yeah. know, you just got to kind of muscle. You're uncomfortable. You're bored. You're hot. You're tired. <laughs> you're in another car, in another bumpy road. 
you know, I was on a road in Madagascar that was so bumpy, I got hurled out the open window <laughs> of the car and broke like three ribs. <laughs> Anyways, so there's a lot of that, right? But then there are these moments of breakthrough where like you haven't been able to communicate with anybody, you know, for months on end. And then suddenly like it clicks together and yeah. you show up in a new city, new place you've never been before. And suddenly you can speak a little bit of the language and everything just opens up and kicks you into flow. And the neurochemistry is so powerful, it overrides everything else. So you remember the flow state. You remember that experience. It's really kind of, you know, if you go through your life and you think about your most potent ex memories – the vast majority of them, especially the positive ones, are going to be flow states. It's simple neurobiology. It's just how the brain works. Yeah, that, uh, that certainly makes a lot of sense. All right, so those are some of them. Are there any other triggers that you want to talk about for people? Sure. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, and I think for good for this podcast as, as well, one, the, the, the final environmental trigger is known as deep embodiment. Fancy way of saying you're paying attention to multiple sensory streams at once, right? So... Action adventure sport athletes pull this all the time because they are experiencing weightlessness, weightedness, zero G's, multiple G's, and polyaxial rotation or spinning, rotation around your middle, right? We're gravity bound creatures. These are really novel sensations, right? And they grab hold of kind of our visual field and our proprioception and vestibular awareness of balance and body position in space. Um, and then there's kinesthetic stuff, and right, it's grabbing hold of a bunch of things and it's driving attention into the now. And it works really, really well. But again, don't have to be an action adventure sport athlete. In fact, uh, a bunch of years ago, uh, a couple of researchers went looking for kind of the highest flow environments they could find outside of the action sports world. And what they found was Montessori education, which is often described as embodied education, right? Mm -hmm. Don't just learn about, you know, solar power, go out and, you know, build yourself a, you know, a little solar array, right? So yeah. you engage your hands and your brain at the same time and, um, drives attention into now, produces a tremendous amount of flow. And anybody can do this, right? This is learning through doing. So deep embodiment using multiple sensory systems at once really, really works well. And you can, you know, Zen walking meditation, by the way, that is a deeply, that's deep embodiment, right? That's what, that's what's going on there. That's Yoga. the same kind of trigger that shows up there. Yeah. Um, or if you've ever read, um, the inner game of tennis or the inner game of skiing, those books were all about the deep embodiment trigger and how to kind of take advantage of it. So there's a, you know, there's a deep literature and a lot of different thinking on this trigger, but it's very, very, very powerful. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like yoga could be another, you know, really good modality for that as well. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a cool story. One of the earliest flow hacks I ever learned, I was with, um, uh, Glenn Plake. Do you remember Glenn Plake? He's an extreme skier, big Mohawk from the eighties and the nineties. Mm-mm. Okay. Very kind of early, early famous extreme skier. And we were skiing in Mount Hood one day and there was a kind of a fairly gnarly, scary chute we were about to jump into. And at the top of the chute, before we got there, right, this 50 degree skinny, don't fall, fall you die kind of situation. Glenn throws an airplane turn into the chute, meaning he jumps off a little bump, you know, a mogul turns 180 degrees in the air and then drops into the chute. And afterwards, I was like, man, what the hell are you doing? Why would you possibly do this, like, dangerous thing on top of the really dangerous thing we're about to do? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And he said, no. What happens is whenever I get to the apex, we didn't have the language, right? But I'll put it in flow language. When he gets to the apex of his turn, that sensation of weightlessness that you, he gets midair while turning is enough to pull the deep embodiment trigger. So by the time he lands, he's already in flow, yeah. meaning – He's peaking, so the dangerous thing he's about to do is so much easier because he's already in flow, and he doesn't have to worry about like fighting back the fear to kind of get into the flow state while navigating this really scary coir. It was really a brilliant kind of lesson in flow hacking. It's a deep embodiment lesson. Wow, that's pretty. That's pretty rad. So I noticed an anti-flow thing that happened to me because I was just off on a little writing retreat and uh, working on my own book upcoming and. I get, you know, every once in a while, usually when I'm taking a crap, I'll play a little words with friends on my computer. And it's just something I do to kind of keep up with people and occupy some time. And I would notice that in the writing flow state, if I would, you know, go to get a drink or something and I'd see that on my phone and I would click it and and start to, you know, solve these puzzles, these very prefrontal cortex based puzzles, which is what that game 
really involves, it would take me way longer to get back into that writing flow state. So, you know, interesting to kind of look at it in these terms, but that kind of... Well, you're, I mean, you know, there's a lot going on there. So writing is about the creative trigger, right? And the creative trigger is literally pattern recognition, right? When not only does dopamine give, help us detect more patterns, but it, it, there's a feedback loop. Whenever we detect a pattern, we get a little rush of dopamine. So you've done a crossword puzzle, right? You get a correct answer, that little rush of pleasure you're getting, that's mm -hmm. dopamine. Why do you get like three or four correct answers in a row? Because that's dopamine amplifying your pattern recognition system, uh -huh. right? So there is, there, there is some of that in writing, that same thing is present. You're detecting patterns in the language and you're, you know, you're mixing and you're matching and ideas are coming together and as soon as they're linking up, right? But we know across the boards it doesn't matter. And this research actually was done in software coding. Very, very, very high flow. There's kind of books written about the importance flow plays in coding. And uh, the guys who wrote PeopleSoft, Timothy Lester, and I'm forgetting his partner's name, uh, I apologize, uh, found that people, when people get kicked out of flow, it takes about 15 minutes to get back in. Hmm. I personally, like for me with writing, you know, I don't know what you do, but I shut off my phone. There's no email. Everything's yep. turned off. Yep. And I, you know, I get up at four o'clock in the morning to start writing. And I work from like four to eight every day on my own stuff. And, you know, because there's no distraction and I can't, you know, I find that I can't do anything else. The minute I, the minute I start kind of checking my email, it's going to pull me right out Yeah, no and doubt. it's going to engage. You know, the worst thing that can happen is emotions get involved, right? Like if I happen to notice an email that where I forgot a deadline and something, I'm just stressed out or there's something emotional in an email, whatever, it doesn't take much, but a little bit of emotion, you know, engage, suddenly the prefrontal cortex is engaged because, you know, I've got a fear response and blah, blah, blah. And then you're, then you're screwed. So it's, it's interesting though, because some responses that involve emotions like, you know, that anxiety, that fear trigger the flow state, but then some emotional responses are the absolute detriment to the flow state. So it's interesting because flow, you know, it's defined technically, right? Optimal state of consciousness where we feel our best, but that is a total mis misnomer because flow is actually totally completely emotionally neutral. There are no emotions in flow. Mm, yeah, because it's the, totally right because emotions modify behavior and in flow behavior, your, every decision, every action leads seamlessly, fluidly, perfectly to the next, right? Near perfect decision making, nothing to modify, no need for emotion, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the emotion that comes on when we start to like notice it, that's usually a sign that serotonin has showed up, which shows up towards the tail end of a flow state. And it lasts, it's that at long afterglow. And you'll get like, there's still a lot of neurochemistry running around in your brain. But you start to actually notice how good it feels as the flow state is going away. Right, right. That makes sense. So when you, let's say you were trying to hack this and create some triggers, you know, that would get you into flow state. Um, let, let's say you, you took a physical trigger. Like we have this implement here at Onnit. It's called a cyborg. And it's like an endo board, uh, except way more difficult. It's a single ball on an internal rail system. And so you can move in 360 degrees instead of just on that one axis, like a, like an endo board. Um, pretty challenging, especially if you start to try and do tricks like shove it and things like that. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's so exciting. Your appropriate receptors, everything is, is going, it makes a lot of sense. Let's say you do something like that. You, you know, go for a risky trick. Um, and the odds of falling down are, are fairly decent on that as well. So there's some risk, obviously it's not the same risk as surfing a giant wave or something like that. So let's say you use that as a trigger, then how long can you expect that the benefit of that to kind of carry over? So it's interesting because like, you're going to need more than that, right? It's right. going to, uh, like, for example, actually let's, let's go back. Let's talk about a skier moving down a hill. It's not just like they jumped off a cornice at the top. It's that they interpreted every aspect of the terrain on the way down. So there was risky moves coupled with creativity, pattern recognition, all that stuff coupled with deep body. So a lot of trick. You want a lot of things going on at once. Mm -hmm. What I would there's sort of two answers to your question. Um, so I don't I don't know. 
my Stephen's rule, and this is because I'm a guy who's broken almost 100 bones and I'm 47 <laughs> years old and I still, you know, hurl myself down mountains at high speeds all the time. And, you know, I'm talking to you now and I can't really walk across the room because I took a fall at 50 miles an hour a couple of weeks ago and my <laughs> ankle isn't quite right. right. So, right, I, you know, I, I, my rule is try the dangerous thing after you're in flow. Don't try it as a way to get in flow. Ride different things in. Uh -huh. So, and let me give you an example because this is, and I'll give you stuff right out of the Flow Genome Project using, so we'll start people, one of the other flow triggers is a, and this is kind of the most famous one. It was discovered back in the 60s by uh, University of Chicago psychologist, uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, who's kind of considered the godfather of flow psychology. Um, he was also the one who coined the term. He discovered that flow is ubiquitous, so it shows up you know, in anyone and did a lot of the groundbreaking research and did some of the research into the flow psychological triggers. The most prominent, famous one is the challenge skills balance, right? which means we pay the most attention to the task at hand when the challenge slightly exceeds our skill level. Mm. You want to stretch but not snap, right? That's too much, too much anxiety. You get too much norepinephrine drives you into fight or flight, right? Not enough risk, not enough danger, not enough whatever. You're bored. You're not paying enough attention, right? So there's this sweet spot. And it's, you know, it's the point at which you're uncomfortable, right? That's where yet you need to be. You're outside of your comfort zone for sure. But what we'll do at the Flow Genome Project is we will scale people up with indo boards. So we'll start people on indo boards and we'll get them balancing and maybe we'll teach them a couple of tricks. And then we'll teach them cup stacking exercises while they're balancing on the indo board. Mm. We'll also put them in uh, kind of versus headsets, which are really, Sense Labs developed them. They're really great biofeedback, neurofeedback uh, EEG headsets. Um, and we'll give them uh, neurofeedback along the way to kind of monitor their performance. We'll, and we'll accelerate them along this kind of challenge skills progression to drive them into flow. And once, you, you know, once somebody's in the zone, that's when you're going to try the shove it. That's when you're going to start learning tricks. Yeah. No, right. That makes sense. Learning them before is, you know, and I, you know, personal experience in my experience, like trying to learn to do, you can do it. And, you know, and I, you know, I, I do it on mountain bikes and I do it on skis all the time, but I've learned like it's better, you know, exhaustion will get you in, into the, into flow, right? There is exercise induced transient hypofrontality usually shows up after it depends on the sport but you know if you're running it's when your brain shuts down right when the mm. chatter goes away yeah a lot of people once that happens call it zombieing out it's just right once you zombie there. out if you introduce a little bit of dopamine so like once you zombie out i let's take running i always tell people run you know usually for me like i gotta run about two and a half three miles before my brain really shuts off so i'll run two and a half three miles out some trail and then i'm gonna run you know, I'm going to jump into the woods and I'm going to try to run downhill through the trees quickly because mm -hmm. it once you have exercise induced transient hypofrontality, you kick a little dopamine into the equation by taking some risks, having to make some creative decisions. It will drive you right into a deep flow state. It's a really quick rocket ride in. So oftentimes I will try to ride exhaustion into the zone. And then, um, and then do something creative or dangerous or whatever, um, and then start stacking those on top of each other um, once I'm in flow already. And I, you know, same thing happens while writing. You know what I mean? I don't know mm -hmm. your experience. I always start out editing what I wrote yesterday because right. there's not a lot of chance. I'm not taking chances, but what I'm doing is I'm finding better patterns. Right. So there's really there's good access to like there's a good, I have a high chance of success of a, finding a couple in a row with sentences click into place or maybe there's a nice you know turn of phrase or alliteration or something that's triggering pattern recognition and then by the time I start writing from scratch right I have to write the new stuff I'm already a little bit into flow and everything's fired up it just makes it so much easier yeah that that makes a lot of sense and I really like what you're talking about with stacking modalities you know I mean it, it's really curious it just gives you a whole toolkit of different things that you can try um, to try <laughs> to try and get you more reliably into this state, which as, you know, as we all know, is incredibly productive. You know, I mean, you could spend five hours writing if you're not, if you, for whatever reason, don't reach flow. First of all, it's going to be crap. Second of all, the actual volume is going to be minimal, or you can spend an hour, you know, that kind of 500% difference, one hour mm -hmm. of being in this, you know, being in the zone, being in that writer's flow state, and you'll produce way better stuff and way 
way more than you would have in five hours. You and know, you're, I think you're drilling around. down into something that's actually um, really fundamental, the flow hacking, which is you need a different kind of mindset. I, the people who are best at this, right, are people who have built their life around flow. And I'll give you a per my I'll give my own life as an example, right? Most of the time, I do. If I'm home, I do three things. I write, very very creative. A lot of chance for flow. I hurl myself down mountains at high speeds. <laughs> Again, right? A lot of chance for flow. And my wife and I run an animal sanctuary. And there is an altruism triggered flow state known as Helper's High. It was discovered by Alan Lukes, who founded Big Brothers Big Sisters back in the 90s. And it's a really long flow state. It'll, normal flow states are, last a couple of hours tops. This flow state can last a couple of days. It's really interesting. Yeah. So, you know, I have built my life around this stuff. And, you know, my, my latest project this year's project is I want to learn to play the guitar so I can start, you know, adding music, which is another, you know, deeply flowing experience in. I want to add one more trigger in. And I think anybody who's really good at this stuff has, has done that. They've built their lives around flow. That said, to get back to your point, there's a lot of like go slow to go to fast with flow hacking, right? You want to stretch but not snap. If you're a high performer, you're going to take on massive challenges because that's your nature and it's going to be too big, too much, and you're going to take off, kick yourself way out of flow, right? You're going to kick the challenge skills ratio way out of whack and you're going to deny yourself the flow state. Mm. So instead, you have to go slow to go fast across the boards, even you know, active recovery. For flow, you get eight hours of sleep a night. Take yeah. naps. Yeah. Your body needs all of its flow is expensive to produce. You need a lot of restful energy to, to get there. So you have to do a lot of things that feel indulgent in a sense, right? But they're actually because the magnification is so great because you could work for five hours in flow and get a week's worth of work done. Literally, it's worth it. Yeah, looking, you know, <clears throat> talking to you today and, and understanding the lingo and going through this, it really allows me to see my entire life in a different light. Even from, you know, childhood, I remember there was this one exercise that I would do that didn't really make a lot of sense to me. But whenever I was feeling kind of out of sorts, and this was probably from when I was about eight to 13, we had a swing set that was about seven, eight feet high, the top beam. And I would climb out, and it was a pretty narrow beam, and I would climb out on this top beam, and it was at a particularly windy part of the property. And it was grass underneath, so I'm not going to die if I fall down. But it's like a seven-foot drop for a 10-year-old kid. That's significant enough. And I remember I would walk you know, the length of this beam there and back. And by the time I was back, the whole nature of my day was altered. It was different. you know. And that, to me, was this perfect amount of challenge, but not too great that it kicked me out of it. And so I can track back from that to all the sports, to everything that I do now, even that, you know, the, the helper's high, some of those things I do when I know that I'm contributing to the greater good, to I just picked up learning, uh, learning the flute, to all of these different things, even to this past Friday where I did a live podcast for the first time and it was 350 people who paid to see me and Duncan Trussell do a podcast. And just having that kind of additional external pressure brought by far the best kind of podcast presence out of me that I've had. And so just looking back at the things that have been successful and the things that haven't been, um, you can really characterize a lot of, at least my own life, uh, as these kind of cycles between flow and not flow. I, you know, I think it's, I think it's there for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's especially if you're doing anything creative, if you're doing anything entrepreneurial, like these things are, you know, driving you forward on a certain, on a certain level. I mean, even, you know, even when you talk about passion and purpose, right? People like to color those words with all kinds of mystical nonsense, but really why they're so important is we pay more attention to the things that we, we care about, we're passionate about, right? It's a focusing mechanism. It's a passion is a flow hack because it focuses our attention, mm. right? And it's, you know, it, it, it's a different way of a, approaching your life, but I, you know, I think ultimately, Anybody who's on this path is going to end up putting flow front and center in their life anyways and kind of building their life around it because I think it's the only kind of – it's the best success hack I know of. Yeah, no doubt. Well, Stephen, this was fucking awesome. Thank you, my friend. How can uh, – obviously, there's the book, Rise of Superman. I highly recommend it. Where else can people find you um, and uh, what else should they be looking for coming up from you? 
Uh, first thing you should be looking for is Rise of Superman. Uh, I've got a new book coming out next week. It's called Bold, co-written with Peter Diamandis. It's the follow-up to Abundance. And um, we talk about flow in there uh, from an entrepreneurial, from a business perspective, and really applying kind of flow to business to drive up productivity and entrepreneurship and things like that. So that, that's coming out. But stephencotler.com. Uh, you, there's also the flowgenomeproject.com. And one thing that's, that's cool on the Flow Genome Project, if you go there, um, there's a free flow diagnostic. So it, you know, it, it's a 16 question questionnaire and it, it kind of lumps you into one of four categories. It's not perfect. Usually people end up in a couple of categories at once, but it basically looks at you and says, look, do these things. This is where you're likely to find the most flow in your life. Um, so anybody can take that. That's at the flowgenomeproject.com. Awesome, man. Well, thank you for the time and uh, good luck with your new book. Let us know if there's any way we can help for sure. Thanks, man. I totally appreciate it. All right. Take care, everyone. Peace. Peace.